like to tell us. So I know very large prints. Yes. Cape Pembroke, which is the easternmost point on the island. 
miles from the location of the Falkland Spring Memorial to the Atlantic Conveyor. And there's a description and picture of this in our order of service. Just as we here today are hoping those present at Cape Pembroke will remember those who died on board the conveyor 40 years ago, and we thank them for their own acts of remembrance for those who died on board that Liverpool ship. Before we began the service today, and rang the bell, which is in the narthex at the moment, which has been brought by friends from Hull, it's a replica of the bell from the Atlantic conveyor, a fitting way to start our service. But during the service, we shall hear accounts of Cunard and ACL's history of supporting the nation in times of military need, and of the Committee of Resources in 1982 to support the military. We shall also hear about the military response, as with no advance planning, a task force was assembled. And finally, we'll hear from Captain Hashmi, who later sailed in the South Atlantic on an ACL ship. Let us pray. Lord God, creator of land and sea, we remember those who are part of the Falklands Task Force and pray for all who lost their lives or who live today with the legacy of that conflict. Be with us today as we hear their story, as we give thanks to those who returned, and pray for all those who face conflict today. As our hearts reach out to people in Ukraine, we pray for victims of war, for displaced people, and for international cooperation in the search for peace and justice. We ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We remain seated for a moment as the Magister Lord Lieutenant to Mother's side reads a message which has been sent to us from Her Royal Highness Princess Royal Lord Lieutenant.
with her speed and range, the Cunard flagship could provide the hastily mustered South Atlantic Task Force with a unique asset. So too could the container ships then service with the company's freight provision. And so it was in the spring of 1982 that Cunard once again answered the country's call to a conflict far away. Queen Elizabeth II, Atlantic Conveyor and Atlantic Causeway were ready for war. Assets for the task force, targets for the enemy. As each ship plotted, it plotted its course south, diplomatic routes remained open. Many hoped and prayed a peaceful solution to the crisis engulfing the Falkland Islands and governments in London and Buenos Aires would be found before the warships and merchant ships reached whatever lay off the outpost deep in the South Atlantic. After handing over their ships to the government, Cunard knew as little as everyone else about what lay ahead for their vessels and those working and travelling on board. Cunard's crew volunteered to join the ships, taking up their emergency roles, the numbers stepping up far exceeding those required to operate their requisition vessels. By putting themselves forward, these men and women became the latest in the company's 182-year history to do so. The memorial stones at the back of the church remember their predecessors who made the ultimate sacrifice serving their country with Cunard. When the call comes, Cunard ships and Cunard crews are there. As Cunard, Cunard's Lusitania maintained a vital transatlantic service during the dark days of the Great War in Europe, which was torpedoed and destroyed off Ireland as she was bound for her home port. Here in Liverpool. 1,198 souls, passengers, and crew on board the perished in that loss. It was Cunard's Lancastria after sailing for the Princess, Princess Landing Stage just over the road here, which was bombed and sunk off Saint Nazaire in Brittany, where she took on Allied forces and civilians escaping occupied France in June 1940. Estimates suggest as many as 5,000 were lost as Lancastria sank. Today, here in Cunard's spiritual home by the Mersey, we mark an important anniversary of another war sacrifice and another chapter in the history of both our company and our nation. Forty years ago today, Cunard's Atlantic Conveyor was attacked by Argentine forces with the loss of 12 lives, six Cunard crew, including her master, Captain Ian North, and six service personnel. Atlantic Conveyor was the first British merchant loss in action since World War II. Nowhere is that loss felt more keenly than here in her home, home port, the port from which she departed on her final fateful <coughs> voyage, a voyage to answer the nation's call to be loved. <coughs> Atlantic and there, lost but never forgotten. Trade. <coughs> Trade. Make nations. For centuries, trade routes have brought opportunity and prosperity. Mercantile business based on ships crossing oceans, linking continents, countries, and communities. Here, where we gather today, in one of the world's great port cities, trade and commerce involving ships of every conceivable kind, crewed by skilled mariners, is the thread running through the rich tapestry of the river. The River Mersey, Port of Liverpool, as famous and splendid a waterfront as you will find anywhere in the world. And as famous and famous a city as you will find anywhere too. Trading in peacetime puts coffee in our cups, food in our fridges, and gadgets galore in our living rooms. Just a few miles from here, a royal seaport contained the terminal. Our fleet of container, row, row, multi purpose ships trade between Europe and North America, crossing the Atlantic Ocean <clears throat> on a route pioneered here by Sir Samuel Cunard in 1840. Like his battle steamer Britannia, modern ACL ships link continents, countries, and hundreds of communities, trading in peace. Sadly, as the horrors we have witnessed unfold elsewhere in recent weeks and climates, training in peace can never be taken for granted. Forty years ago, the peace of an island community, its trade, its way of life, 
Its very existence is threatened and fought over. The British government reacted to what it deemed a hostile threat to sovereignty and the Falkland Islands with force. A force in which ships, their crews, and all they carried were to the fore. Ships including Liverpool's own Atlantic Conveyor and the Atlantic Coastline. The conveyor was birthed just up the road, just up the dock road, in West Canada Dock, when she was taken up from trade by the government. From being stacked full of the staple workers of global trade, the container, the ship sailed from Liverpool bound for the naval base in Plymouth with scarcely any cargo. From the Devon Dock Yard, after much work and readiness to play on harness and the task force, she started to take on, she started to take on her new cargo. Helicopters, fighter jets, fuel to fly them, and missiles for them to fire. No longer trading in peace. No longer fostering the goodwill more of links between continents, countries, and communities. Instead, sailing into a war zone as an auxiliary aircraft carrier. Four decades on, it is impossible to imagine how those men serving on the Atlantic conveyor adapted to their role, or the anxiety of their entire crew merchant and service personnel bound for the military exclusion zone with a cargo capable of altering the entire course of the conflict. And as we all know now, it was her cargo of the detection of helicopter and jump jet enemies from within the walls formed by stack containers around the perimeter of the deck, which made her a target for the enemy. Once found and identified within the missile range of hostile aircraft, Despite a dramatic and late change of course in a bid to avoid incoming missiles, nothing could avert the catastrophic strike. Multiple explosions and fires crippled the ship. Aviation fuel, missiles, and tons of ammunition ignited in the immediate aftermath of the deadly aerial attack. Survivors later gave horrific accounts of the extent of the damage and the speed with which any hope of the ship's recovery vanished. Twelve souls were lost, including Captain Ian Moore, five of the Cunard ACL crew, and six military personnel. We will remember. Atlantic Conveyor. Trading in peace, lost in the war, 40 years ago this afternoon. Reading from the letter of James. Who is wise and understanding amongst you? Show by your good life that your words are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is airy, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, 
then peaceful, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Thanks be to God. Despite warnings on Argentinian activity in the region from the ice patrol vessel of HMS Endurance, the British government was initially on the back foot when President Gautieri ordered the invasion of British territory south of Georgia in the Falkland Islands. There was no contingency plan on the shelf for retaking the islands, and the UK's amphibious capability had been severely diminished during previous defence reviews. Once it became clear that military action was required, a task force had to be pulled together at short notice from whatever assets were available. Following the invasion on 2nd of April, in an emergency cabinet meeting, approval was given by the government for a military operation to retake the islands, named Operation Corporal. The priority now was to get sufficient forces south to reinforce ongoing diplomatic activity, though hope of a resolution without military action was low. On 4th of April, the nuclear-powered submarine Pigeon's Conqueror left Fast Lane in Scotland before the aircraft carriers Invincible and Hermes and their escorts left Portsmouth a day later. The task force also needed transport for the thousands of troops that would be required for an operation of this scale, as well as shipping that could carry the logistical support that is integral to any amphibious operation. Though this was partly delivered by the Navy's amphibious shipping, including assault ships, HMS Spears, and Intrepid, plus six logistic ships, the Ministry of Defence also had to turn to the commercial sector to make up the deficit. It did this by requisitioning British chartered ships, a process that had not been used since the Suez crisis in 1956. On its return, following the world cruise, the ocean liner SS Canberra was requisitioned and set sail on 9th of April with three commander brigade Royal Marines on board. Arguably, a slightly less refined clientele than the group we used to, and with a far, far higher ratio of starches and tattoos. The ocean liner, Queen Elizabeth II was also requisitioned, later leaving Southampton with five infantry brigade from the army on board, definitely a less refined quality. <laughs> so while the common perception is of a large fleet deploying as one group, in reality, the vessels had to leave individually at best speed from wherever they were located, picking up extra stores and crew on the way before rendezvousing further south, many at Ascension Island, a British territory approximately halfway to the Falklands. Crucially, having loaded in a relatively unplanned fashion, the sentry was also used to resell equipment in the right configuration for amphibious operations. Once complete, the task force comprised of 127 ships, made up of 43 Royal Navy vessels, 22 Royal Fleet Auxiliary ships, and 62 merchant ships, which included Liverpool's own MV Atlantic Conveyor. The task force had to carry everything it would need to sustain a military campaign thousands of miles from home including the aircraft that were defending, the helicopters and landing craft that would move troops from ship to shore, and the food, fuel and ammunition that would enable them to see it through to the end. Many of the people on board those ships had never heard of the Falkland Islands, and some even said they thought they were heading to an island off Scotland, rather than a piece of land 8,000 miles away. They were also unsure exactly what they would be asked to do when they got there, with dipl diplomatic negotiations ongoing and the situation on the ground changing day by day. But if there's one thing the Marines in Paris have always been ready to do at a moment's notice, it is to fight. As the task force approached the area where amphibious landings would take place, the air battle was intensified. Argentine Camberas, Skyhawks, and Mirages threw regular sorties against British ships, with Harriers on board Invincible and Hermes launched to protect the fleet, supported by submarines deployed off the Argentine coast to provide early warning when jets were launched. Submarines also played an important role in enforcing the British total exclusion zone, a ring of 200 nautical miles around the island, 
designed to give ships and aircraft freedom to manoeuvre ahead of the landings. On 1st of May, what was previously just a line on the chart suddenly became very real after the sinking of the Argentinian cruiser General Belgrano by the submarine Hitchens Conqueror. Though controversial at the time, this effectively ended the Argentinian naval threat to the task force, with ships returning to port until the end of the conflict. But the subsurface and air threat was prevalent for both sides. Two days after Belgrano sinking, the British destroyer HMS Sheffield was lost following an Axis-7 missile strike and became the first Royal Navy ship sunk in action since the Second World War. As the task force manoeuvred to protect the amphibious landings, further casualties included HMS Ardent, Antelope and Coventry before MV Atlantic Conveyor was struck by two air-launched Axis-7 missiles on 25th of May. Alongside the tragic loss of life, this action also destroyed three and four Chinook helicopters and six Wessex helicopters, a logistical blow which placed the entire mission on a knife edge, and which ultimately led to the forced march, or Yelp as we call it, across the East Falkland to the capital Stanley at the end of the conflict. For me, it is that iconic image of a Royal Marine weighed down by his kit with a Union flag <coughs> flying from his burger, which captures the immense courage of the soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and civilians that we remember here today. <coughs> the challenges of medical support delivered to the land battle in the Falklands in 1982 gives much weight to the term used in the British military, A war and B war. These considerations loom large in the minds of defence medical services providers. A war is much the like in the Straits by the Falklands. The war, for many in recent generations and known by many still serving in the military today, is Afghanistan, which was very particular and peculiar in its nature. We should exercise a great deal of sensitivity when comparing losses in the <coughs> campaigns, particularly at what is only a starting point here in considering the challenges. Every loss is one of a dear loved one and everyone involved put in valiant effort, some making the ultimate sacrifice or enjoying a great deal of suffering to, enjoy, to defend the freedoms we have today. I have no wish to demean the efforts and losses during the Afghan campaign in Operation Herrick, and I apologise now if it seems as I am, I most certainly not. It was mightily hard for them as it was for those in the Falklands. Contrasts are stark, however, and sadly cannot be avoided. It took until 8th of February 2010 when Operation Herrick had been running for seven years, eight months and five days for the UK death toll in Afghanistan to reach the 255 UK deaths suffered during the Falklands campaign. The Falklands ran for two months and 13 days. Early on things went wrong for the medical plan for the Falklands through the tragic loss of the Atlantic player and all the assets we had on board, including medical equipment and air platforms, helicopters, went. The helicopters would have been used, among other duties, to evacuate casualties quickly from battlefields to hospital care. Relative freedom of manoeuvre, including absolute air superiority and security that UK forces had in Montpellier, lie in stark contrast to that in the Falklands. On the medical front, what Herrick afforded a very high level of medical intervention in a very developed hospital to develop a supreme level of technical care that is arguably near unachievable and very high intensity in the warfare. In recent years, when we are exercising our people in the Army Medical Services, some of our more experienced who have served in Afghanistan will often refer to assets that would not be available in, in, in a battle that we might prepare for today. And we have to use the example of the Falklands to remind them that such would not be available, and particularly the aeromedical asset the military. <coughs> the extremely high proportion of casualties who survived having reached the field hospitals and the red and green life machines that are the main is working together um, at Ajax Bay in the Falklands and Camp Bastion in Afghanistan and of course the uh, marine assets in, in the Falklands was remarkable, and it was a remarkable tribute to the dedication of their staff in both conflicts. In, both conflicts. in Afghanistan, very highly trained doctors could quickly be sent forwards, relatively safely and stressed relatively, very quickly in the mud to deliver care. 
Captain S.J. Hughes, the regimental medical officer of two power during the battle of Goose Green, had to consider the risk of his potential loss to the regiment and his patients, and restrained himself going further forwards heroically to deliver care. He commanded his medics to do it instead. He and his team had to deliver care in most austere conditions and frequently innovate through lack of supplies and delay patient evacuation. The makeshift is a long word here, it's innovation. The value of delivery of immediate, basic and well-drilled care at the point of illness, wounding and injury such as that provided by two powers of the residential aid post, was continually illustrated during the Falklands and very highly developed during our period. The correct application of dressings, delivery of good field wound care, pain relief and fluid replacement where required was learned and relearned and is now firmly in our doctrine. The early use of antibiotics was a feature in both campaigns. Tourniquet use came to the fore in Operation Harry. This field care in both conflicts was mainly delivered by the combat medical technician. In 1982, the CNT was a firmly male figure. The first females not arriving on the Falklands to deliver health care until after the war, and then they were nurses. Come Operation Herrick, the typical CNT was often a very robust and committed woman. In Defence and Medical Army Services, we are absolutely committed to delivering the highest standards of compassionate care to our troops and our enemies, demonstrating our values, suffering from conflict, remembering and learning from the experiences of Falklands War. I would especially like to tell veterans here today that our young people, our future, and DMS and AMS are eager to understand their experiences and ready to take up similar challenges that we may have to undertake to deliver the same level of care. I promise to them that we can do this with the same dedication and commitment as was delivered to them in 1982 and in more recent conflicts. <laughs> Of that as well. 
I'm sure quite apart from the fact that I've mentioned it, I'm sure that many of you have been thinking about the current conflict in Ukraine at various points this morning. A dictator using an invasion <coughs> for his own political ends is a theme which repeats itself. And today we are seeing the potential for further damage playing out. The world stood by when Russia annexed the Crimea in 2014. The world did nothing when Bashar al-Assad used chemical weapons on his own people in Syria at the same time. We are living with the consequences of inaction today. <coughs> but let us also be clear that we should not associate entire nations and their peoples with war. There will be individuals always who commit horrific and unjustified actions. But the young Russian conscripts whose bewildered faces we see on our screens today are remarkably similar to some of the young Argentinian soldiers from 1982, caught up in a conflict which they did not understand and had little ability to influence. General Galtier, Vladimir Putin, Bashar al-Assad, these are the men who hold life cheap and his own people are often victims of conflict as well. At no point should we rejoice in war and conflict, but we must be realistic, not just about the concept of a just war, but also about the threat posed by inaction. Our Bible reading today begins, Who is wise and understanding among you? And that wisdom is needed at every point of conflict because it is never simple. Who is the aggressor? Who are the victims? Who seeks liberation? Where does defence become aggression? These are challenging questions. And given what I've already said about Gautieri, Putin and Assad, listen to this line from the reading. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. Conflict is perhaps almost an inevitable consequence of dictatorship. When the fault and conflict was over, a service of thanksgiving took place at St Paul's Cathedral. Robert Brunsey, the Archbishop of Canterbury, angered the then Prime Minister, but Prime Minister by not making victory the theme of the service. During the sermon, he said, War is a sign of human failure, and everything we say and do in this service must be in that context. Perhaps with the distance of time and the insight of a different age, we can see the wisdom of these words from an archbishop who himself was awarded the military cross during the Second World War. War is indeed a sign of human failure, but we must be thankful that there are men and women who are willing to go into armed conflict for the sake of others, and families and loved ones who will wave them off, praying earnestly that they will return. We should always, always work for peace. But sometimes there are consequences in avoiding war. ship's electronic signature was suppressed 
and how to conceal her presence from those who would otherwise be planning to attack her. In the total darkness, the danger from the numerous icebergs close to the ship was considered even greater than that from enemy, enemy force. Finally, despite the risk of revealing the ship's exact position, the radars were finally switched back on, and soon, more than 1,000 icebergs, large enough to be detected, showed up on the bridge radar screens. As those on the bridge wrestled with this most severe test of their seafaring skills and expertise, elsewhere on board, preparations were being made for an important rendezvous with other vessels in the task force. The QB2's perilous course was to an anchorage in Cumberland Bay East, South Georgia. This was to be the meeting place for the QB2 and other ships in the task force, which in turn would transfer her troops and their kits onwards to the Falkland Islands. The transfer started just before midnight. The freezing temperatures and darkness simply another obstacle to be endured and overcome. As dawn broke, those on board had their first real glimpse of Cumberland Bay and the striking sight of snow-capped mountains and glaciers surrounding this little haven in the South Atlantic. As light levels rose, helicopters joined the operation with troops, their kit and supplies being whisked from the QB2's improvised helipads. Inbound, however, were survivors of attacks on HMS Ireland, HMS Coventry and HMS Antwerp. Many had little more than the ragged clothes they clambered on board in. Canal's volunteer crew did their very best to make the new arrivals welcome as best as they could under the prevailing conditions. The QB2's infirmary was soon full of the seriously injured. Those more fortunate were settled into cabins. All the while, the weather was deteriorating, and so too was the threat level to the liner. A British tank had positioned 400 miles due north of QB2 had come under attack. This was of particular concern to those on the Canard flagship's bridge, who deduced that if she remained in Cumberland Bay, QB2 was well within range of coming under attack too. Later, it was learned that the Buenos Aires High Command had deployed a civilian Boeing 707 with extensive range to search the South Atlantic from 18,000 feet altitude in search of the QB2. If that mission had been successful with the ship's location identified, the threat to the Cunard flagship would have become even more acute. Eventually, with transfers complete, save 60 tons of live ammunition remaining on board, orders were given for QB2 to sail immediately away from danger. On 3rd of June 1982, further orders confirmed that the Queen Elizabeth II was to return home to Southampton, where she arrived on 11th of June, following a jubilant welcome in the Solent, led by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth the Queen Mother on board the Royal York Britannia. After a round trip, a voyage of 14,967 nautical miles completed in just under 30 days, QB2 was home alongside safe and sound. Her most perilous passage in service to the nation was complete. Those stepping safely ashore in Southampton knew that six of their Pinar colleagues would never return home here to Liverpool. The attack on the Atlantic conveyor resulted in a shocking and devastating loss felt throughout the company, the country, the merchant navy, and of course, Liverpool. The port mourned each of those lost, including one of the most renowned and respected masters ever to navigate the Mersey, Captain Ian North, DSC. With the raging inferno all around after the Argentinian exercise attack and being critically injured himself, Captain North gave his final orders to a ship's company to abandon ship. He pleaded with his crew to leave him behind in order to afford every man a fighting chance to save their own lives first. But his loyal ship's company carried him into the survival craft, where he finally succumbed to his injuries. A new Atlantic conveyor was built in 1984 by Swan Hunters as a replacement in which I had the privilege of briefly serving myself before she was sold by the Pinard Line in 1996. The officer's wardroom aboard the new Atlantic conveyor was named the North One, in memory of Captain North's service and sacrifice 
and where we also honoured all colleagues and shipmates we lost that fateful day 40 years ago in the service of our country. Mortis Memorials. Thank you. They shall grow not old, as we need as our left to grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years can bear them. At the going out of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them.